I was basically concerned about what was going on in the world. I couldn't understand the starvation, the destruction, the killing of innocent people. I mean, making sense of those things is a very difficult thing to do. And um, I, when I was 12, I became an actor. I was bottom of the class. I haven't got any qualifications. Um, I was told I was dyslexic. Um, in fact, I have got a qualification. I got a D in pottery, was the one thing that I did get, which was, uh, which was useful, obviously. And um, so concerned is where all of this comes from. Um, and then, I, being an actor, I was doing these different kinds of things, and I, and I felt the content of the work that I was involved in really wasn't cutting it, that there surely had to be more. And at that point, I read a book by Frank Barnaby, this wonderful nuclear a physicist, and he said that media had a responsibility, that all sectors of society had a responsibility to try and progress things and move things forward. And that fascinated me, because I've been you know, messing around with the camera for most of my life, and then I thought, well, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can become a filmmaker. Maybe I can use the form of film constructively to, in some way, make a difference. Maybe there's a little change I can you know, get involved in. So I started thinking about peace, and I was obviously, as I said to you, very much moved by these images, trying to make sense of that, you know, could I go and speak to older and wiser people who would tell me how they'd made sense of the things that are going on? Because it's obviously incredibly frightening. But I realized that, having been messing around with structure as an actor, that a series of sound bites in itself wasn't enough, that there needed to be a mountain to climb, there needed to be a journey that I had to take. And if I took that journey, you know, no matter whether it failed or succeeded, it would be completely irrelevant. The point was is that I would have something to hook the questions of, you know, is humankind fundamentally evil? Is the destruction of the world inevitable? Should I have children? Is that a responsible thing to do, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So I was thinking about peace, and then I was thinking, well, where's the starting point for peace? And that was when I had the idea. There was no starting point for peace. There was no day of global unity. There was no day of intercultural cooperation. There was no day when humanity came together, separate all, all of those things, and just shared it together, that we're in this together. And that if we united and we interculturally cooperated, then that might be the key to humanity's survival. That might shift the level of consciousness around the fundamental issues that humanity faces if we did it just for a day. So I, obviously, we didn't have any money. I was living in my mum's place. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, we started writing letters to everybody. I mean, you very quickly work out, you know, what is it that you've got to do, you know, to kind of, you know, fathom that out. I mean, how do you create a day voted by every single head of state in the world to create the first ever ceasefire non-violence day, the 21st of September? And I wanted it to be the 21st of September because it was my granddad's favorite number. He was a he was a, a prisoner of war. He saw the bomb go off at Nagasaki. It poisoned his blood. He died when, he was 11, died when I was 11. But he was like my hero. And the reason why 21 was the number is 700 men left, 23 came back, two died on the boat, and 21 hit the ground. And that's why we wanted it to be the 21st of September is the day of peace. So we began this journey, and we launched it in 1999, and we wrote to heads of state, their ambassadors, Nobel Peace laureates, NGOs, faiths, uh, you know, various organizations, literally wrote to everybody. And very quickly, some letters started coming back. And we started to, you know, sort of build this case. And, and I remember the first letter, one of the first letters was from the Dalai Lama, and of course, we didn't have the money, we were playing, guitars and you know, getting the money for the stamps that we're sending out all of these emails. And a letter came through for the Dalai Lama saying, this is an amazing thing, you know, come and see me. You know, I'd love to talk to you about the first ever day of peace. And I did, we didn't have the money for the flight. I rang Sir Bob Ayling, who was CEO of BA at the time, and said, mate, we've got this uh, you know, invitation. You know, could you give me a flight? Because you know, we're going to go and see him. And of course, we went and saw him, and it was amazing. And then Dr. Oscar Arias came forward. And actually, let me go back to that slide. Because when we launched it in 1999, this idea to create the first ever CFC, far and non-violence. We invited thousands of people, well not thousands, but hundreds of people, lots of people, all the press, because we were going to try and create the first ever World Peace Day, a peace day. And we invited everybody, and no press showed up. I mean, there were 114 people there. They were mostly my friends and family. And that was kind of like the launch of this thing. But it didn't matter, because we were documenting, and that was the thing. It's a win. You know, for me, it was really about the process. It wasn't about the end result. And that's the beautiful thing about the camera. They used to say, the pen is mightier than the sword. I think the camera 
memories, you know, and just staying in the moment with it was a beautiful thing and really empowering, actually. So anyway, we began the journey, and here you see people like Mary Robinson I went to see in Geneva. I'm cutting my hair, it's getting short and long, because every time I saw like, Kofi Annan, I was so worried that he thought I was a hippie that I'd you know, cut it, and that was kind of what was going on. But, um, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about it now, but... Um, Mer so Mary Robinson, uh, she said to me, listen, this is an idea whose time has come. You know, this must be created. Kofi Annan said this will be beneficial to my troops on the ground. The OAU at the time, led by Salim Ahmed Salim, said I must get the African countries involved. Dr. Oscar Arias, Nobel Peace Laureate, president now of Costa Rica, said, you know, I'll do everything that I can. So, you know, the, I went and saw Amri Musa at the League of Arab States. I mean, we, you know, we, we sort of... I met Mandela at the Arusha Peace Talks, and so on and so on and so on. Well, I was building the case to kind of prove you know, whether this idea would make sense. And then we were listening to the people. I mean, we were documenting everywhere. 76 countries in the last 12 years I've visited, and I've always spoken to women and children wherever I've gone. I've recorded 44,000 young people. I've recorded about 900 hours of their thoughts. I'm really clear about how young people feel when you talk to them about this idea of having a starting point for their actions for a more peaceful world through their poetry, their art, their literature, their music, their sport, whatever it might be. And we were listening to everybody, and it was an incredible thing. You know, working with the UN and working with you know, NGOs and building this case, I felt that I was presenting a case on behalf of the global community to try and create this day. And the stronger the case and the more detailed it was, the better chance we had of creating this day. And it was this stuff, actually, this, this, where I actually was in the beginning kind of thinking, no matter what happened, it didn't actually matter. You know, it didn't matter if I didn't create the day of peace. The fact is, is if I tried and it didn't work, then I could make a statement about how unwilling the global community is to unite. Until it was in Somalia, where, you know, picking up that young girl, and this young child who'd taken about an inch and a half out of her leg with no anaesthetic, and that young boy who was a child soldier who told me he'd killed people, he was about 12. These things made me realize that this was not a film that I could just stop, and that actually at that moment something happened to me which obviously made me go, I am going to document, if this is the only film that I ever make, I'm going to document until this becomes a reality, because we've got to stop We've got to do something where we unite separate from all the politics and religion that as a young person is confusing me. I don't know how to get involved in that process. And then on the 7th of September, I was invited to New York. The Costa Rican government and the British government had put forward to the United Nations General Assembly with 54 co-sponsors the idea of the first ever ceasefire non-violence day, the 21st of September, as a fixed calendar date, and it was unanimously adopted by every head of state in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But the hundreds of individuals obviously made that a reality, and thank you to all of them. I mean, that was an incredible moment. I was at the top of the General Assembly just looking down into it and seeing it happen. And as I mentioned, when it started, we were at the Globe, and there was no press. And, and, and now I was thinking, well, the press is really going to hear this story. And suddenly, we start to institutionalize this day. And Kofi Annan invited me on the morning of the September the 11th to do a press conference. And it was 8 a.m. when I was stood there, and I was waiting for him to come down, and I knew he was on his way. And obviously, he never came down. The statement was never made. The world was never told there was a day of global ceasefire and nonviolence. And it was obviously a tragic moment for the thousands of people who lost their lives there and then subsequently all over the world. It never happened. And, uh, and I remember thinking, you know, this is exactly why, actually, you know, we have to work even harder. And we have to make this day work. It's being created, nobody knows. But we have to continue this journey. And we have to tell people, and we have to prove it can work. And I left New York, you know, freaked, but actually empowered. And I felt inspired by the, the you know, the, the the possibilities that if it did, then maybe would, we wouldn't see things like that. I remember you know, sort of putting that film out and going, the cynics. The, I, was, I was showing the film, and I remember being in Israel getting absolutely slaughtered you know, by some guys having watched the film, that you know, it's just a day of peace. It doesn't mean anything. It's not going to work. You're never going to stop the fighting in Afghanistan. The Taliban won't listen, etc., etc. You know, you know, it's just symbolism. And that was like even worse than actually what had just happened in many ways, because 
you know, it couldn't, uh, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't not work. I, I, I'd spoken in Somalia, Burundi, Gaza, the West Bank, India, Sri Lanka, Congo, wherever it was, and they'd all tell me, if you create a window of opportunity, we can move A, we can vaccinate children. Children can lead their projects, they can unite, they can come together. You know, if people will stop, lives will be saved. That's what I'd heard, and I'd heard that from the people who really understood what conflict was about. And so I went back to the United Nations, I decided that I'd continue filming and make another movie, and I went back to the UN for another couple of years. We started moving around the corridors of the UN system and governments, you know, and NGOs, trying desperately to find somebody to come forward and have a go at it, you know, see if we could make it possible. And after lots and lots of meetings, obviously, you know, I'm delighted that this man, Ahmed Fauzi, one of my mentors and heroes, really, he managed to get UNICEF involved in UNICEF, you know, God bless them, they said, OK, we'll have a go. And then UNAMA became involved in Afghanistan. There was this thought, well, could it work in Afghanistan with UNAMA and WHO and you know, civil society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, it was like, and I was getting it all on film, and I was recording it, and I was thinking, you know, this is it. This is the possibility of it maybe working. But even if it doesn't, at least we've started, you know, it, the, 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 the door's open, and there's a chance. And so I went back to London, and I went and saw this chap, Jude Law, and I saw him because he was an actor, I was an actor, I had a connection to him, because we needed to get some press, we needed some traction, we needed the media to be involved. Because if we start pumping it up a bit, maybe Maybe more people would listen and you know, there would be more kind of like, uh, you know, when we got into certain areas, maybe there would be more people kind of interested and maybe we'd be helped financially a little bit more, which is you know, desperately difficult, uh, but I won't go into that. But you know, so, so, Jude, so Jude said, okay, I'll do some statements for you. And whilst I was filming these statements, he said to me, where are you going next? I said, I'm going to go to Afghanistan. He's like, really? And I could sort of see a little look in his eye of interest. So I said to him, well, do you want to come with me? Do you want to come? You know, it would be really interesting if you came. It would help, and it would bring attention, and that attention would help kind of leverage the situation, you know, as well as all of the other sides of it. I mean, I think there, there's a number of pillars to, to success. One is you've got to have a great idea. The other is you've got to have a constituency. You've got to have finance, and you've got to be able to raise awareness. And actually, I could never raise awareness by myself, no matter what I'd achieved. So these guys were, were absolutely crucial. So, then, so, so he said yes, and we found ourselves in Afghanistan. It was a really you know, incredible thing that when we landed there, you know, I was talking with various people and they were saying to me, you know, you've got to get everybody involved here. You can't just expect it to work. You have to get out and work. And we did. And we traveled around and we spoke to elders, we spoke to doctors, we spoke to nurses, we held press conferences, we went out with soldiers, we sat down with ISAF, we sat down with NATO, we spoke down with the, the UK government. I mean, we basically sat down with everybody, in and out of schools, with ministers of education, holding these press conferences, which of course, now, was loaded with press. Everybody was there. There was an interest in what was going on. This amazing woman, Fatima Galani, was absolutely instrumental in, in what went on. She, she uh, was a spokesperson for the resistance against the Russians, and her, and her Afghan network was just absolutely everywhere, and she was really crucial in getting the message in. And then we went home, and we'd, we'd sort of done it. We had to wait now and see what happened. And I got home, and I remember one of the team bringing in a letter to me from the Taliban. And that letter basically said, we'll observe this day. We will observe this day. We see it as a window of opportunity, and we will not engage. We're not going to engage. And that meant that you know, humanitarian workers you know, wouldn't be kidnapped you know, or killed. And then suddenly, I obviously knew at this point there was a chance. And days later, 1.6 million children were vaccinated against polio as a consequence of everybody stopping. And uh, you know, like the General Assembly, obviously the, the you know the most wonderful, wonderful moment. And so when we we, we, we wrapped the film up and like, we put it together because we had to go back and we put it into Dari and Pashto, we put it into the local dialects, we went back to Afghanistan because the next year was coming, and we and, and 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 we wanted to support, but more importantly, we wanted to go back because these people in Afghanistan were the heroes. They were the people who believed in peace and the possibilities of it, et cetera, et cetera, and they made it real. And we wanted to go back and show them the film and say, look, you guys made this possible, you know, and thank you very much. And we gave the film over, and obviously it was, you know, it was shown, and it was amazing. And then that year, that year, 2008, this ISAF statement, Kabul, Afghanistan, September 17th, General Stanley McChrystal, Commander of International Security Assistance Forces in Afghanistan, announced today ISAF will not conduct offensive military operations on the 21st of September. You know, they, they were saying they would stop. And then there was this other statement that came out from the UN Department of Security and Safety saying that Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, because of this work, the violence was down by 70%. 
70% reduction in violence on this day of peace. And that completely blew my mind, kind of almost more than anything. And I remember being stuck in New York, this time because of the volcano, I mean, which was obviously much less harmful. But I was there, and I was there thinking about what was going on, and I kept thinking about this 70%. 70% reduction in violence in what, was, what everyone said was completely impossible and you couldn't do. And that made me think that if we can, if we can get 70% in Afghanistan, then surely, surely we can get 70% reduction everywhere. We have to go for a global truce. We have to utilize this day of ceasefire and nonviolence and go for a global truce. Go for the largest recorded cessation of hostilities, both domestically and internationally, ever recorded. It's exactly what we must do. And on the 21st of September this year, we're going to launch that campaign at the O2 Arena to go for that process, to try and create the largest recorded cessation of hostilities. And we will utilize all kinds of things, kind of dance and social media and visiting, you know, come to Facebook and visit the website and sign the petition. And it's in the six official languages of the United Nations. And we'll globally network with government, intergovernment, non-government, education, unions, sports. And you can see the education box there. We've got resources at the moment in 174 countries trying to get young people to be the driving force behind the vision of that global truce. And obviously, the life-saving has increased, the concerts help, linking up with the Olympics. I went and saw Seb Coe, I said London 2012 is about truce. Ultimately, that's what it's about. Why don't we all team up? Why don't we bring truce to life? Why don't you support the process of the largest ever global truce? We'll make a new film about this process. We utilize sport and football. On the day of peace, there's thousands of football matches all played from the favelas of Brazil to wherever it might be. So utilizing all of these ways to to inspire you know, individual action. And ultimately, we have to try that. We have to work together. And when I stand here in front of all of you and the people who will watch these things, you know, I'm excited you know, on behalf of everybody I've met that there is a possibility that our world could unite, that we could come together as one, that we could lift the level of consciousness around the fundamental issues brought about by individuals. I was with Brahimi, Ambassador Brahimi. I think he's one of the most incredible men in relation to international politics you know, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. He's an, amazing, he's an amazing man. And I sat with him a few weeks ago, and I said to him, Mr. Brahimi, is this nuts? I mean, you know, going for a global truce, is this, is this possible? Is it really possible that we could do this? He said, it's absolutely possible. I said, what would you do? Would you go to governments and lobby and use the European system? He said, no, I talk to the individuals. It's all about the individuals. It's all about you and me. It's all about partnerships. It's about your constituencies. It's about your businesses. You know, because together, by working together, I seriously think we can start to change things. And there's a wonderful man sitting in this audience, and I don't know where he is, who said to me a few days ago, he said, Jeremy, because I did a little rehearsal, and he said, I've been thinking about this day, you know, this day, and I've been imagining it as a square with 365 uh, squares, and one of them's white. And it then made me think about a glass of water, which is clear. If you put one drop, one drop of something in that water, it will change it forever. By working together, we can create peace one day. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.